Mary and Joseph were both instructed to call his name Jesus. Matthew tells us that the angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Luke tells us that the angel said to Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And in this Advent season, we've been made aware that his name, as well as anyone's name, is more than a personal designation. It is more than a title. For Mary and Joseph were instructed not only to title him Jesus, but were instructed to be a part of making him Jesus. Oh, yes. The God-man himself. For he was nurtured, and he was brought up in the admonition of the Lord, and it was Mary and Joseph that did it. Mary and Joseph were God's tools through which the human personality, God he was, but both God and man, they were the tools that molded Jesus. And that very thought is so astonishing to me. Is it not simple, but so very profound? He grew as we grew. He learned as we learned. Oh, I know there were great things about him even for the, from the time that he was a baby and at the age of 12. But his personality, his human personality, was molded as our personality is to be molded. But oh, what a responsibility. It was to be molded perfectly. And that task was given to Mary and to Joseph. That means that God can bring up a perfect personality in other than a robot, perfectionistic humans. That's not the perfection he's looking for. That's not what raises perfect children. Not robot actions that take so many steps this way and so many steps this way as if we were programmed and machine. No. It's the attitude of a perfect heart that molds perfect personalities, full and developed and without frustration able to solve problems and able to come to maturity and meet the challenge of life. And the devil need not buffet you that you're not perfect. Of course you're not perfect. Neither were Mary and Joseph, but they raised a perfect child, and his name was Jesus. Not only in title, Mary and Joseph made him Jesus. And God could not err. So he chose the perfect parents. Not robot parents. For they were sinners like us. All of you with Catholic backgrounds, if you don't believe that, will kindly bear with my theology. I'm not angry with you. <laughs> don't be angry with me. But I believe that Mary was a sinner and that Joseph was a sinner. Only God was perfect. Only Jesus, the God child, was perfect. But how much more amazing that they should raise a perfect man. So when the night angel said, call his name Jesus, he meant to raise him perfectly to raise him and make him the man that God's called him to be. Call his name Jesus 
make him that personality that I want him to be. Of course, God was there to overshadow and help, but in the, car, in the car, place of carpentry, the actions of Joseph were so very important that he said he learned obedience by the things he suffered. He learned how to become his name, and his name was perfect. Isn't it wonderful today to know that love covers a multitude of faults? As faulty as we are, if our heart is right, we can raise perfect children. Now get rid of that, that, that's, uh, you know, that thing called perfection. You and I are so frightened of. That's why we can't understand Christian perfection. I'm looking for a perfect car. God see fits to, to grant me a new automobile. I want a perfect car. But that, that doesn't mean when I get down right there that every bit of that paint is just right. It won't be. Or that it, I want it to be as close to right as possible. But, you know, if it doesn't have a bashed-in fender, I'll be considering that. It's got the seats in it and the motor runs and you put gas in the tank. Uh, if, you, if it's all put together right, I'll be considering that a perfect car. I might even say to one of you or to my family, isn't that a perfect car? Of course, I'm well aware but he was also perfect in the absolute sense. Because when he came, God prepared for him a body. And God, in fact, came in flesh. And divinity is perfect. But thinking of Mary and Joseph, I would have you remember that Dr. Turnier reminds us that the baby hears the mother's voice and the very calling of the baby's name forms the personality. The very tone and tenor and attitude of that mother forms that baby's personality. I was in Parker yesterday talking to uh, Lori Lloyd, used to be Lori Wagner, and she said, Oh, Oliver, we got your tape. What's in that name or what's in a name? And she said, you know, I've been calling my baby's name. And she said, you know, that whenever you're preaching on the tape and God, when the anointing comes upon the tape, that my baby moves within my body. She said, we've noticed it. When the anointing comes in the tape, my baby moves within the body. He, he's hearing his name. His personality is being formed. There's a lot back of this for those who have not been with us for several services. And uh, that which is back of us is very exciting. But you get some hints in what we're saying by way of review and introduction. The prophet Isaiah wrote in the 49th chapter of Isaiah in the first verse, that the Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb he called me by my name. How do you feel when someone calls your name? Don't you feel better? I went up to my first grade. She looked around on her shoulders. She said, I don't see any hay. Well, her name was Mrs. Bunn. And... Uh, I learned to call her Mrs. Bunn. Mrs. Bunn, Mrs. Boyd, Mrs. Abernethy, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Lyles, Mrs. Honor, Mr. McFarland. Well, isn't that wonderful? All the way through the seventh grade. You can remember every one of them just like that. They like to be called by their name. When Rabbi Kohler was here, he was rather astonished that before we got out of the office, we were calling the names of Linda, Rebecca, Stephen and Robert it meant something to him. It means something to the unborn child. And it means something to the born child. There's a difference. There's a difference in the feeling that comes through. There's a difference in the touch of the voice. And because there's a difference, there's something developing in the personality. 
Today's sermon is not entitled, What's in a Name? Today's title is, What's in that name? Or, What's in the name? Well, what does the name of Jesus mean? It means, most of you know this, but let's review it together and I'll go on to something that perhaps you do not know. It means that Jehovah is salvation. That's why the angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His name is salvation. J-E comes from Jehovah or from the Hebrew, Hebrew root, I am. J-E, Jehovah, I am. Back to the revelation of God himself. And that's what upset uh, the Pharisees so much when Jesus said in John 8, 58, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And it had an awful uproar on his hands because he said, in fact, I am divinity. Before Abraham was, I existed, the pre-existent Christ. And we had an awful fight. Liberalism in Christianity today does not accept this, even though Jesus said it himself. You say, well, Brother Hope, what's the matter with them? Well, they say that in the second or third century that, that the church rewrote the Scriptures. Every year, more and more, we authenticate that the Scriptures were written very early. But we're still, we have still hurt people. Still we have hurt people from the time of Bookman and his demythologizing. When we ignored the evidence of history and said, well, this is not really, we've got to uncover all this and, and demythologize the story of Christ. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Those fellows have long since gone to their grave, most of them without the victory. We have a chance either to believe Butman or Matthew, Tillich or Mark, Bart or Luke. Now, I know that Bart was neo-Orthodox, but he was not fundamental. Or we can believe the Apostle John. Most of Christianity has chosen to believe otherwise. Therefore, they have missed the very significance of calling the name of Jesus. This passage this morning, I feel like, is an exhortation for not only Mary and Joseph to call his name, but for you and I to call his name. Thou shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Or we could say about Jesus' name that it means I am salvation. God had revealed himself in the Old Testament to Moses. Remember what he said, I am that I am. And I have said to you sometime earlier that his name was so great it could not be limited. There really is no name for God. We, we, we name his attributes, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, Emmanuel. We name his attributes, but really there's no name for God. David knows what the Old Testament says because his name are some consonants with the word Lord in the middle, isn't it? Where we get the name Yahweh. So we really don't know. We really don't know. There really is no name for God. And his name was considered so holy that men would not even speak what you and I have spoken in times past. Adonai or Yahweh, Lord, is what they said. The word of the Lord came unto me. I am that I am is a name too great for limits. But God was specific about his attributes. In Exodus 17 and 15, he revealed himself unto Moses. Remember when Mo Joshua was fighting the battle and they had to put uh, Aaron on one side and her on the other? When he was fighting that battle, after that was over, they, the Lord said unto them that I am thy banner. 
Exodus 17, 15. I am thy standard. When you lift my name up, I will fight your battles for you. In Judges 6 and 24, God revealed himself unto Gideon. And he said unto Gideon, I am thy peace, or Jehovah Shalom. In Genesis 22 and 14, remember when Abraham was offering Isaac and the ram was caught in the thicket? God provided the sacrifice. He named himself that. And he said, I am thy provision, or Jehovah. Wonderful revelation. You see, Abraham, Abraham had to recover the, the name of God. Adam knew what he was like. And it would seem that the patriarchs, the early patriarchs, knew what he was like. But there's a gap there from Noah to Abraham and where we, we lost what God's really like. Say, is it important to know what he's like? It's important because you and I are, are raised with a lot of false conceptions. A lot of us are raised with a, uh, with a thought that God's tyrannical and that God is constantly setting in judgment upon us and that God is wrathful with us. So we don't, we're frightened of him. And we have, we have no, we don't feel the warmth of his call and the warmth of his love. But he wants us to know his name. Listen to this. To David, he revealed that he was our shepherd. That's what it means. Psalms 23, 1, Jehovah Raha. I am thy shepherd, the Lord. What is it? Jehovah Raha. The Lord is my shepherd. And if the Lord's my shepherd, I don't want for anything. And he does all these other things for me, including making me lie down in lush, green pastures, including restoring my soul. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful for David to have that revelation. You might say that David heard God's voice, like Mary and Joseph. And God said to David, call my name. My name is Shepherd. It's not only what you've already been taught, David, that I am your banner and I, I am your peace and I am your provision or your healer, but David, I am also your shepherd. I'm not sure that I understand the revelation that he gave Ezekiel. But in Ezekiel 48 and 35, when Ezekiel saw the new Jerusalem, it says that Jehovah said that he was Jehovah Shammah, or I am there, or I am thy presence. I am in the midst. I am the center of everything. I think we can see that revelation clear as we go to the book of Revelation and see that God was God that dwells with men and was sinner uh, to men. I left one out, and I thought it most interesting. And it was the revelation that God gave Jeremiah. It has something to do with what he said to Mary and to Joseph. God said to Jeremiah... Jeremiah 23 and 6. I am thy righteousness. I want you to look at the context of that passage. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now that is prophetically what God revealed to Mary and Joseph through the angel. The Lord, our righteousness. Thou shalt call his, people, his name Jesus, salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. The instruction of the angel is not only to Mary and Joseph, 
but also to me and to you. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. I'll share something with you preciously and carefully. But it's probably been maybe a year since I've had dryness of mouth. But I've got it this morning. Now, the reason for that is opposition. That means either some of us here or the powers of the air are deadly opposed to us knowing the name of our Lord. For to know the name of our Lord is to have relationship with Him. And I thought if I shared that with you, the saints would plead the blood. Now, let me share something with you. I'm not frightened at all. I'm relaxed. But it doesn't make any difference. My mouth is dry all around here. Very difficult to preach on Easter and on Christmas. But my, my heart's happy. I'm delighted with my subject. But I just wanted you to know that I'm aware, old oh devil, of your presence. Now, I don't often do that. But in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And I plead the blood of Jesus, for I'm talking about the most wonderful person the world has ever known. I'm talking about the most wonderful person in heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the Lord's trying to say to us this morning that you also, we also should call his name Jesus. Why? Because everything we need is in that name. Everything we need is in that person. Everything you and I need is in that boy child that came to Mary and came to Joseph. Well, what do you really need? Well, we need what his name suggests. We need salvation. The Lord was helping Jeannie so wonderful when she was singing there. That he came and rescued us from our sins. I thought, oh God, somehow help us to know this morning that we're sinners and that we're in great need. Now look at this. There is no salvation for us unless we know what we are. There's no salvation unless we know that we're sinners. There's no salvation unless we know we're caught in an awful thing on this earth. Oh, may God reveal it to us today that you and I are in need of salvation that you and I are sinners, and even if we're saved, we can only really say that we're sinners saved by grace. Of course, God wants us to quit the sinning business, but there's very few that have been able to leave entirely the life of having their own way behind. If I stay away from the word sin, then I cause us to understand it much better at that point. For sin is everyone going his own way. We need, we need saving from ourselves. The apostles preached it, for they said, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's what makes us distinctively Christian. For we believe that Jesus was sent from God that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was born of a virgin. We believe what the Scriptures say about the Son of God. But do we really believe? Are we really calling His name Jesus? If we're still in our sins, we don't know His name. We've simply titled Him. Because to know Him is to become like Him. When we meet our marriage partner, we meet somebody very different. Different, and the psychologists and psychiatrists say that we marry, for the most part, we marry uh, not ourselves, but we marry somebody different. Something does happen in marriage. We become one. If we're really married, if we really love one another, we start becoming alike until it's one of the strangest things 
you've ever seen. The more people live together, not only do they act alike, that is if they're becoming one, they also begin to look alike. Have you noticed that? There's, simil there's similarities in countenance, similarities in somehow in the facial features, even though they come from very distinct and very different backgrounds. I'm looking at some of your faces now, and I'm, I'm almost shocked. Are you? I just looked out there, I saw, well, Perry and Pam and Gary have not been married very long, but there's similarities. Of course, if you're, if one is is uh, great larger than the other, and you may not be able to tell it so much, but uh, if you live together, you'll be able to see that you're coming, you're becoming to look alike if you observe people that live together. Jesus, not only in His name and in His person. takes care of everything that we need. But Jesus reveals what God the Father is really like. You say, well, Pastor, why is that so important on this Christmas Sunday? It's important because the deepest need of your heart is to know the name of God. The deepest need of your heart is to know what Jesus is really like. And if you get into, the, into comparative religions, you'll find that whether it be Hindu or Buddhist, what they're basically trying to do is to find and to know God. The world over. Oh, how blessed we are. Because in our heritage and in America... God has revealed his name to some. And therefore, you and I at least are professedly Christian. We're seeking after the Christ. There are some of us here that would be Buddhist if we were over there or Hindu, but there are some of us here who have such a deep hunger that we would have to know God. Therefore, we'll have to know Jesus because he sent Jesus to reveal what he's really like. This is the great yearning of all religions. This is the great yearning of my heart and the great yearning of your heart to know what God is like. And the writer to the Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image, that is the exact image of his person, the person of the Father. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Study him. You'll find out what he's like. Wasn't it Philip who said, show, show us the Father? And Jesus responded as recorded in John 14 and 9 by saying, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Oh, my. The Hebrews had wondered what God was like for years. The men of the earth in their various religions had wondered what God was really like. And when we take a look at Jesus, we see not so much, dear ones, Jesus proper. But we see what God's like. We see the name of God. For he was the express image of the person of God. I don't know what that done to those fellows if it had really come upon them all at once. Say, so what's God like? Well, look at Jesus. If you want to get a little bit the feeling of the disciples, watch how you react around godly men. Watch how you react around someone who really, ha really is denying themselves and walking with God. You'll get a little bit of the feeling. For the more that person denies himself, the more that, more that God is revealed. The more that, that divinity shines, and the more awfulness, the more reaction, the more, the more terrible thing, because men want to go their own way. They do not want to be reproved in their sinfulness. Even though there's a need in everyone's breast to know God, to call the name of Jesus, to have the revelation of God, there is also a power that came upon us through Adam and Eve that causes us to 
to shun that revelation once it tries to come deep. Because when it comes deep and when it comes pure, it means that it's to claim all of our life. And we've been, we have mistakenly believed that if God puts full claim upon us, we'll just not have any fun. We'll not have any happiness. We'll not know any glory. And precisely the opposite is true. That goes back to the name of Jesus being everything we need. We used to sing a chorus. He is all I need. He is all I need. All, all I need. He is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all. saying quite a bit. When we travel through foreign countries and when we travel through the Kanawha Valley Basin, Taze Valley specifically, or the mountains beyond Racine or wherever, God wants us to live in such a way that the world knows that Jesus is all we need. He's trying to get his name across. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, God has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question. What is the glory of God? Well, I know we feel glory when we feel his presence. But what is the glory of God? We could say many things as to the attribute, his attributes being his glory. But doesn't the name of Jesus reveal what is really central about his glory? If you have your Bibles, read with me in Ephesians, the first chapter, where Paul says something is very central to the glory of God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I submit to you today on this Sunday before Christmas, that the grace of God says more about his glory than most any other attribute. We probably thought it was majesty. We probably thought it was omnipresence, and that's in his majesty. We might have thought that it was his omniscience, his knowing everything, or his omnipotence, his power, his transcendence, his being above all. But according to Paul, the real glory is in his grace. Now, I want you to think about grace a minute. This is all in the name of Jesus. His grace is not just a blessing for us. That's great. And his grace is involved. But grace has to do primarily with our salvation. God, we are sinners saved by grace, saved by the unmerited favor of God. You say, oh, by the grace of God, I've done this. Oh, yes. But the real glory of God is that he saved us and he loved us and he sent Jesus for us when we were so unworthy. His grace is his glory. And that's a magnificent thing about God. That's what makes the Christ child so very different 
than, than the gods or whomever, the prophets that are revealed by the other religions. Christ came in grace. Christ came to tell us that God was lowly. Christ came to tell us that God made us and that he loved us and that in our sins he was willing to redeem us. That's tremendous. No other religion says that. It's brand new. It's the mystery of godliness. Oh, my. How much we ought to appreciate his glory. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. So grace, we're still talking about the name of Jesus. Grace is the very heart of his glory not the grace of blessing but the grace of salvation which leads us to the third reason for knowing his name why thirdly we must know his name because until we know his name we can't even know our own See, name in Scripture represents person. It's the same as person. It's a stand-in. And we, we, we see the effectiveness of it today. I go to the bank, and I can I put a check over that, but they will not give me the money for that check unless my name is good and my name is signed. If I put Oliver C. Hogue on there, the money comes across the counter. That is, if I'm true to my person and write it for no more than I've got in my account. So the name and the person are identical in Scripture. But we cannot know our own name unless we know his name. <laughs> God knows what we're like. And Isaiah said that he, we can take that Scripture for us all. Jeremiah or Isaiah, it was said about himself, but it's true for us all. God knows what we're like. God knows what our real name is. And he's called us before we were born. But our parents sinned and our name was changed. Adam was not really what he was supposed to be like. Cain was not really what he was supposed to be like. He was wrongly so. Abel, by faith, became his name. But it's only through the help of God, the mighty power of God, that we can become our names. And it's only through salvation in knowing him that we can become what we're truly supposed to be. It's so wonderful to have Kermit and Thelma here with us this morning, as well as the parents of Rodney. One of the joys I received the last time that Kermit was with us was finding that he, that he was still becoming more truly his name. Say, so how do you know it, Brother Hogue? I heard it by the tone of his voice, and I saw it by the beauty of his person. Well, I said, that's Kermit. Well, what does Kermit mean to you? Well, Kermit means God's sermon. I don't know what the name means, but I mean to me. What his name is becoming to me. Kermit means God's sermon. See, God's servant. Ker Kermit means love. Kermit means faithfulness. Kermit means steadfastness. Ker Kermit, Kermit means an oak in the wind. We might write this down by Kermit's name, I'm telling you. This is what it meant to me before he left. But when I saw him a few months ago, he was far more Kermit than the day he left. What happened to him? Well, his name was still being changed. All the rough things that he had faced and all the problems of life had been used as molders to mold him into Christ. That's called sanctification. But that name starts at salvation. Except you be converted and become your own name. Like a little child. What God wants you to become. You cannot even enter into the kingdom of God. You and I cannot get into the kingdom by being our own selfish, mean name. It'll never make it. There's got to be a change. There's got to be a difference. That's what Christmas, you know what Christmas is all about? It's the good news that there, that, that there can be a difference. 
Boy, they had every other, they had every kind of thing. The Epicureans, they tried to live in such a way that nothing affected them. They said, well, it's no use trying to affect anything. We'll just try to be happy in spite of everything. Well, that's just impossible to be that way. Well, the Stoics were something like that too, I think. Not to have any feeling at all. And they thought God was like that. God had no feeling, so they thought they knew God. They thought they knew his name, so they tried to become like him. Don't pay anything, don't pay any attention to anything, good or bad, just become like God. He is, well, what would you say? Whew. Just wasn't much to God. Unaffected. God's not like that. Isn't it something that everyone needs to become himself? Isn't it something that everyone needs for the carnal self to be slain? Christ is our salvation. The scriptures tell us that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I can't even say this as joyful as I would like, but I'm happy about it. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And it's, it goes on to say, and all things are of God. Let me share something else with you. There's very little chance. In fact, there's virtually no chance that you and I will be changed. There's virtually no chance outside of the mighty power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave to change us and to bring us back to what God wants us to be. And so when you hear people say a leper can't change his spots, you're right, he can't. But God can change a leopard's spots. God, make an el my, God could make a leopard look like a monkey. Or he could put stripes on him. He could, he's able if he wanted to, if there was purpose in it, he could do it. Nothing's impossible with him. He could do that. He can also make a sinner, a sinner look like a saint. He can also change the old man that is in me, reckoned to death, and make me look like a new person. He can make me love. He can make me love everybody. He can make me careful with everybody, careful with everybody's name, even sinners' names. You know how, care, how careful I've been about wanting you not to call each other names. And oh, when we were children, how, how it hurt when somebody called us the wrong name. If it was Shorty or uh, whatever, it, it hurt. Or to abuse our names. Hoagie or Hog. Sometimes Pig. Even before pig became a popular, a popular derogative, it hurts. It just doesn't register, does it? We like to be called by the right name. God wants each of us to handle each other in such a way, but I want to tell you, tell you something, dear ones. You and I are a menace to each other until we know Christ. You and I are actually dangerous for each other. Unless we've been changed, unless we know Jesus, we're going to put things in our children that's going to kill us one of these days. Unless we know... See, well, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. Mary and Joseph were not perfect in the absolute sense, but they raised a perfect man. I know he, they ra he was a perfect man in the absolute sense, but, but we who are not perfect can raise so-called perfect children. That is, they'll grow up and want God. They'll grow up and love all men. They'll grow up to, to want to be righteous people. That's perfection, friend. Christian perfection is what? John Wesley said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, mind, and strength. But if we don't, if we continue in our own name, if we continue not to know his name, and there's no change in us, then we're turning everybody for evil around us. Boy, what is it like when good confronts evil? That's the big impact, friends. The more we become like Christ, the more we confront evil. I'm not talking about fanaticism that goes out and try to drag people in. There was a man out in Utah the other day somewhere. A wife was saved under Brother Helm's ministry and awaiting out there in Salt Lake City. The wife went home to her husband and said, I'd like to bring this man home. He said, don't you dare. There had been a 
fundamentalist minister, and not all fundamentalist ministers are this way, just happened to be a fundamentalist minister who'd come into the, to the kitchen and, and so-called collared her husband, tried to drag him to Christ. You can't drag anybody to Christ. So he said, don't you bring him in this place. I'll tell you what you do. If he comes, I, he and I are going to have it out. And I'm going to embarrass you if you bring him in here. You know something? He's, he was on his own rights. There wasn't anything wrong with what he said. No, no man has a right to try to possess another personality. Only the Holy Spirit can, can draw us to the name of Christ and change our own names. And yet we go around in the flesh trying to change people. And that very attitude of trying to change people, that's what criticism is, by the way, is of hell. That very attitude of trying to change people. See, well, he's so-and-so. We're trying to change him. That criticism, that's of hell. He's like this, and she's like this, and he's like this. That's of hell. That's criticism, criticism, and it's the name of the devil. God doesn't want us to do that. Boy, if we know anything about what we are in our own name, we'll be saying, oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Think of that. That Pharisee didn't even know his own name. He said, I thank you, God, I'm, like not, I'm not like other men. There's a man over here who was an old sinner boy, and he said, oh, God, forgive me. Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Jesus said he went down justified. Went down with a changed name. Went down a sinner and came up a saint. Cleansed in the precious blood of Jesus, looking to the cross. Well, to really know God is to know oneself. And that means that we know that we are nothing and therefore in great need. Jesus said on the Mount of Beatitudes, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know that they are in spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who know they have nothing. Or the Hebrew goes like this. Oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is everything that God has. Because they know in the flesh what they are. What's in that name? Our salvation. What's in that name? Finding our own name. What's in that name? Now listen carefully. There's an awful lot here. To find the one that God intended for us to live with. That's what's in that name. Say, well, Brother Hogue, how did I get her? I wasn't living for God. For God may have given you to her and her to you by the great hand of providence by the mercy of Almighty God. But there's a better way to get her, and there's a better way to get him, and let's let God make the choice. And I'm not asking anybody in the world to submit to anybody else, but I'm asking all men to submit to God. God most certainly will bring someone for you to walk with unless you are called to the gift of celibacy. What's in that name? Well, a right place to prepare for heaven. That may be West Virginia. That may be Scott Depot. That may be Racine. That may be Ashland, Kentucky. But there is a right place to prepare. What's in that name? Finding the people of God. Ephraim Ekpo had a wonderful father who's now about 90 years old. And when Ephraim left for the United States, he said, Son, while you're in the United States getting your education, I want you to go on a spiritual mission for, Ni for the Nigerian Church of the Living God. The Lord has revealed to me that while you're over there, you will find a servant who truly walks with God and that you will find a people who are really of God. Now, when you get there, I want you to claim them. When you find that name, I want you to claim them and invite them to Nigeria. He also said something else. He said, when that servant comes 
we will have revival in Nigeria. Oh, how important it is for Brother Helm to go when God sends him. Oh, how important it is for us to go when God sends him because his daddy had a prophecy that when the people of God came. So when he walked into this church, has it been since we've been in the new sanctuary? In the old sanctuary when he first found us, he, he said, I have found the people. I've been looking for six years that my father told me about. I've been in all these churches. But he said, I found the people my father told me about. When, when God's servant was here, Brother Henry said, I found the servant of Jesus that my father told me about. I have a father that's like you, Brother Ham. I am now giving you the Macedonian call to come to Nigeria. Boy, something working wonderful, isn't there? The people of Nigeria, Ephraim tells us, are in great superstition. A lot of witch doctor stuff and that kind of thing. But the true name of Christ dispels all of that and causes us to place our hope and our aspirations in him. What's in the name of Jesus? Going daily in the right direction. We're totally given to him either providentially or by direct leading of the Holy Spirit. We may be at the water fountain and he may say, I want you back in the supply room. And we go quickly from the supply room to the water fountain and there we have a meeting that was destined from eternity. A meeting of love and a meeting of blessing and a meeting of God. The results of which go on forever and forever and forever. What's in that name? What's in that name is the wisdom of Christ that causes us to speak words that edify Christ and others. Well, the revelation of that name also has something to say about death. And in closing, I want you to turn with me to Luke, the second chapter, and read about a man who found the name of Jesus. I mentioned him earlier in the service. But I want you to see this in the light of what's in that name. Luke 2 and 25. Well, let's start back with 21 since we're in conclusion. And let's get the whole context. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad I read that passage which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And look what this Jewish man said, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Once we've seen Jesus, we're ready to die. Once we've seen Jesus, we lose all fear of death. Once we've had the revelation of his name and of God, really have it. All problems are solved. That's one statement right there. Ought to make every man, woman, boy, and girl examine me in this place. If that's all I need, but it's true. It's in his name. 
It's in his person because he is God. And he came to reveal what God was like almost 2,000 years ago. In a few days, it'll be Christmas morning. That is the day that we celebrate is Christmas. We will celebrate that name, hopefully all of us, truly. But I know that in a crowd like this, there are those who really don't know who they are. They don't know who they are because they don't know him. For to know him is to know yourself. And to know yourself is to place yourself back in the hands of him who can take care of us, save us, take us through this life, give us what we need, and give us an eternal destiny with God in glory.